Is that a great looking group or what, huh? How about it? So welcome to the Kennedy Space Center. What a great day. I can't wait till this evening when that Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon take off. And once again, we're going to be launching a crew vehicle from Launchpad 39 after an eight year hiatus here at the Kennedy Space Center. It's just one step forward to getting crews to the International Space Station before the end of the year on a US rocket with a US crew from US soil. And we're gonna make that happen. And uh, these are the guys that are gonna be a part of it. And I, I think you all know them, but I'll just run down the line before I turn it over to the administrator here. Doug Hurley, Bob Benkin, our administrator, Jim Bridenstine, Mike Hopkins, and Victor Glover. And these guys, are, you know, you saw them get assigned to fly, except for the one in the middle. He wishes he were assigned to fly. And, uh, but Doug and Bob, they've been tracking this vehicle for a long time. Uh, as we developed it, they were assigned to watch the commercial crew program to be involved. And uh, I'm going to leave the questions to them. But before we open it up for questions, I want to give the mic to our administrator, Jim Bridenstine. He's doing an outstanding job leading us. And uh, I can't wait to uh, get this successful crew launch under his belt. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, for that intro. And um, I just want to share with you how important this is. It's a, a critically important event in American history. Uh, we're, we're on the precipice of, of launching American astronauts on American rockets from American soil, again for the first time since the retirement of the space shuttles in 2011. And this time when we do it, we're doing it differently than we've ever done it before. NASA is not going to purchase, own, and operate the hardware. In fact, we're going to be a customer. We're going to buy a service. And our goal here is to be one customer of many customers driving down the cost and increasing the access to space in a very robust commercial marketplace for human space flight in low Earth orbit. But we don't just want to be one customer of many customers. We also want, ultimately, to have numerous providers that are competing on cost and innovation. And because we have that capability developing right now, of which Demo 1 is a critical, I don't want to say first step, but it's a critical step in the eventuality of launching Americans again from our own soil, because we have that capability, we're going to have more access to space at a better cost than at any point in human history. And we want to continue this progress. I want to say thank you to Bob Cabana. A lot of you here might be local media. And it is absolutely true that with the retirement of the space shuttles and the cancellation of Constellation, uh, this center was devastated. But because of the activities that have been going on here under Bob's leadership and previous NASA administrators, this center, the Kennedy Space Center, is thriving. And in fact, it's growing. And we've got commercial launches, not just Boeing and SpaceX, but in the not too distant future, we're going to be launching the SLS with the Orion crew capsule uh, on a deep space mission all the way to the moon. So we have a lot under development right now. In fact, you could argue we've got more under development right now than at any time, even during the Apollo era. So this is a great time for American space flight. I also want to say this, and it's an important point. Um, we have had amazing support from the administration with the budget requests for NASA. In fact, the president's first budget request took NASA's budget up $1 billion, which was over a 5% increase. And by the time I got sworn in as the NASA administrator, bipartisan support in the House of Representatives and in the Senate gave us an increase of $1.7 billion, an 8% increase in NASA's budget. We haven't seen this level of strong bipartisan support and administration support in a long time. So with all of this support and with these commercial capabilities that have been developing here on the Space Coast, uh, we are in a great position right now. And tonight is going to be a great moment, a great achievement in this uh, future of space exploration and the future of space development that includes launching commercial, where NASA is a customer and we have numerous providers competing on cost and innovation. So with that, I think we'll just open it up for questions. And uh, we have some very special guests here that can uh, maybe even entertain a few of those questions themselves. Uh, hello. I, I think we're asking from over here. Oh, we've got oh, a line. Yeah, here's a mic. We've got, yes, we've got a mic. line. Oh, that's the line uh, over there. Marsha to an AP for Doug and Bob, please. What's it like to be next in line for flying a dragon? And capsule splashdowns, it's also retro, it's back to the future. Could you sort of talk about that too? All right, I, I'll take the first part and then maybe Bob will take the second. Um, yeah, next in line is pretty exciting. Obviously, 
as the administrator said, this is kind of the next critical step in putting people on Dragon. So we've got this flight, and then we've got the in-flight abort, and then, and then ideally our flight soon to follow. So uh, I can't begin to explain to you how exciting it is for a test pilot to be on a first flight of a vehicle. Uh, and you know we'll, we'll be ready when SpaceX and NASA is ready for us to fly it. I think for both of us, uh, as Doug mentioned, there's a, something really exciting about being first, uh, getting to fly a crewed mission kind of coming out of this. Uh, we're going to do it, like you said, the, uh, the old school way. Uh, we both landed on shuttles uh, smoothly at the, the runway here, I think for both of us on both of our shuttle flights. And so really excited on, uh, to be on this flight and to, to take the splashdown at the end. I think Sonny Williams described it the best. It was the one experience that uh, none of the original group of us as commercial crew cadre had under our belts was landing in a capsule, and so we're, we're looking, looking forward to that. Hi, I'm Stephen Clark from Spaceflight Now for Doug and Bob as well. Um, if you could speak a little bit about uh, what you're gonna be doing during the countdown tonight and where you're gonna watch the launch from. Are you gonna be doing any practicing like it's gonna be the real launch day for you guys or just uh, spectators? And also, have you had a chance to strap into this particular Crew Dragon to go inside and look around and give your impressions of what uh, Ripley will experience during the launch? Yeah, we, we have not been in this particular vehicle, although uh, prior to the hot fire, we were out at the pad on the uh, swing arm and, and at least got near it. But we have, actually haven't been in the vehicle, although Bob was here for the CEIT, so he might be able to tell you a little bit more. Um, we're going to be in firing room four for the launch itself, listening along with the team and kind of keying on the things that would be relatively important to us, uh, you know, the timing for the uh, fueling and the different things when we strap in, all those different events. So just kind of keying into what the team's doing at those times. We've been here before for hot fires and for launches, so we've kind of gotten used to the cadence of their team as they launch their Falcon 9. So this will be just one more step in kind of familiarizing ourselves with that, that event. I think uh, we're taking the opportunity with this, this demo flight to learn all that we can in preparation for our upcoming crewed flight. So one of the things that we'll have to do is understand our role as a part of the team that pulls off this, uh, this space flight endeavor. And so part of that is under understanding what happens inside the firing room, what happens out at uh, Hawthorne for the uh, spacecraft control. So we'll be chasing uh, the spacecraft down in some sense. We'll be racing from here across country to get out to Hawthorne for the docking. And then we'll both be in place in Hawthorne to follow along with entry for this vehicle. And it really is our chance to not be on board, but be with the rest of the team that'll support us when we actually fly this vehicle uh, when Demo 2 comes around. Um, I was able to be inside of the Demo 1 capsule uh, a few months back as a part of the uh, kind of a crew exercise to check the interfaces out that the crew on orbit will have to operate to make this mission successful when it gets to the International Space Station. It was a really neat experience. Uh, not everything was exactly as it is right now. It's continued to get uh, polished in some sense to, to, to make it as successful as it can be when it gets to the space station. So definitely excited to have been in a spaceship that's headed towards the International Space Station later tonight. Hi, Jeff Faust of Space News. Question for the administrator. Uh, what's your level of confidence that uh, either Crew Dragon and or Boeing Starliner is going to be ready to start flying people by the end of the year safely? And then also, uh, what's the status of the uh, review of the safety culture of the commercial crew program that you, plan, you announced a few months back would be undertaken? So, uh, number one, I, I would say I'm very confident. In fact, you can write in your article, I'm 100% confident because as far as I'm concerned, you're either for it or you're not, and I think we're going to get it done. Um, as far as the, um, you know, the, the, the safety review that's underway, this is for both contractors. NASA has a long history. We've been through accidents. We've seen them before. And we want to make sure that that culture that we have developed over the years um, as a result of those incidents um, not just applies to our agency, but also applies to our contractors. Um, I'm, I'm certainly not going to prejudge uh, any, any of the results of that. Uh, I will tell you that uh, I'm highly confident that our contractors are complying with the terms of their contract, and I expect that uh, we will find that their culture is very safe, and we look forward to revealing that when the time is right. Uh, Marina Korn from The Atlantic. Uh, this is a question for the crew. I want to ask uh, about your training um, inside Crew Dragon versus shuttle or Soyuz, because the inside of Dragon looks really sleek and like something out of a movie, 
but some of your previous experiences, you've just been faced with wall-to-wall -wall switches and, but and buttons. I'm wondering if you could compare your experiences between the two. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, as uh, Colonel Cabana can testify, 2,000 switches and circuit breakers inside the space shuttle. This vehicle has on the order of about 30 buttons that are hard hardware buttons, and everything else is interacted with the vehicle via the touch screen. So it's, uh, it's an incredibly sleek looking vehicle from the inside, uh, and it's very easy to operate from the crew interface perspective relative to what we were used to with shuttle. So much easier. Um, a lot less errors that the crew can make. The shuttle was very easy. You had switches literally right next to each other, and if you threw the wrong one, you could make your day a lot worse rather than a lot better. And it's just so much more intuitive than this vehicle. So they did a really nice job of kind of setting it up for the crew to be successful. Could, could I address that for a second? Yes, sir. If it's all right, I, I'd like to, uh, to address that as well. And this is an important point. Remember the goal here for NASA is to be one customer of many customers in a robust commercial marketplace. And because of that objective, um, we, we, we have numerous uh, providers that are competing on cost and innovation, and they are preparing for a future where customers are not NASA. Those customers could be, uh, it could be foreign sovereign countries. It could be um, individuals that want to go to space. And so what has happened here is we have one of our providers that has developed a crew capsule that looks as much as possible like the inside of the cabin of a commercial airliner, which is uh, a, a development that took place not because NASA had a requirement, but because NASA is a, com a customer in, in, a, in a robust commercial marketplace of the future where there will be other commercial customers for this kind of activity. So um, that's why I think that the capsule has this very different look than those of the past. Uh, hello, Tim Fernholz from Quartz. Another question for the administrator. Uh, in your previous job in Congress, you were a big advocate for the public-private partnerships and the kind of commercial activity you're talking about right now. Uh, I'm curious if you wanted to reflect, now that we're just at the moment before the launch, uh, how has that last couple years been for you seeing this program come to maturity? And you know, you were talking a minute ago about the bipartisan support for it. Why has it attracted so much support now after maybe being controversial earlier on? So I think, it, I think people have seen the success. They're seeing, when I say success, um, not just uh, commercial partners launching things into space, but they're also seeing uh, the driving down of cost and the increasing of access. They're starting to see uh, a more robust commercial marketplace. The thing that's important for me as the administrator is to consider what the president has tasked me with doing. I've been tasked to go back to the moon sustainably. In other words, this time when we go to the moon, we're going to stay. That doesn't mean we're going to necessarily have a permanent human presence on the surface of the moon, but we're going to have permanent access to the surface of the moon with landers and rovers and robots and humans. And in, 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 in this access, we're going to have more access to more parts of the moon than ever before because of Gateway. In other words, we're going to be able to get to the poles where um, there are. we now know that there are hundreds of millions of tons of, uh, of water ice. Here's the, the point in all of this. We, we really have you know, one uh, exploration campaign with humans, but we have three theaters. <laughs> we have low Earth orbit, we have the moon, and we have Mars. And when we think about those three theaters, each one of them has requirements for funding. And if we can commercialize as much as possible our activities in low Earth orbit, we can drive down the costs, and then we can spend our resources provided by the taxpayer to do things for which there is not yet a commercial marketplace, but where we believe there will be an eventual commercial marketplace, that being cislunar space and the surface of the moon. So um, I was an advocate for commercial in the House of Representatives. That does not mean I was not an advocate for what the government is doing as well. And SLS and Orion are a critical piece of the architecture for this entire, um, this entire exploration campaign, which includes low Earth orbit, cislunar space, and eventually Mars. So again, the goal here is, is to fund the entire package with international partners, which by the way, we're working really hard to grow the international partnership. And I know a lot of you guys covered yesterday the fact that we had this great announcement with Canada joining us for the next 24 years in our exploration of the moon, which is fantastic. We're thrilled about that announcement. Um, but we need international partners. We need them to, to grow the partnership. We need more international partners. There's now more space agencies on the surface of the planet than ever before. 
And we also need more commercial partners, folks that are willing to step up and partner with us. As you mentioned, the public-private partnerships where they, have, they can take advantage of their own opportunities apart from just providing services to the United States government. So uh, the, the, the whole architecture, commercial and government together, uh, putting all of it together is ultimately what's going to make it possible. Hi, this is Diana from Real Clear Media. My question is for the crew or the administrator. Uh, if you could give us some insight about what's been different about the preparations for this unique launch as opposed to others, uh, do you treat this like there are astronauts on board? Can you just give a little insight into what that process has been like getting ready for this? Wow, that's a tough one when uh, we went down the list one, two, and three, and I ended up with that question. <laughs> so uh, uh, I guess the, the way I would describe it um, as you as you look at the demo one vehicle and you compare that to the in-flight abort vehicle or the demo two vehicle, we have to take the lessons that we can from this ship and see whether or not they apply to our mission or if the data that we can collect from this mission is important enough in other areas that maybe we would accept something that isn't quite the same way that we would do it for demo two. Maybe that's a long way to describe it, but what the kind of the crux of the issue is that this is a test flight. Uh, the in-flight abort vehicle will be a test flight. Our flight to the International Space Station will be a test flight in preparation for the mission that, that these two guys, along with uh, two additional, most likely international partner astronauts, will actually undertake when they go for a six-month increment. And so this is a bit of a shakeout cruise. will be the final shakeout cruise before their, their long-term mission on board the International Space Station. Can I add to that, Doug? Yes, sir. Yeah, and I'd just like to add to that a little bit, too. When you talk about the cadence and how we set up for this, you know, uh, it was last week, early in the week, we had a flight test readiness review that the uh, commercial crew program hosted in preparation for the agency uh, flight readiness review that Bill Gerstenmeier uh, chaired here over in OSB2 uh, a week ago Friday, a week ago today. Um, <clears throat> you know, that's the same team that we brought together with some minor differences that we did for shuttle missions. And we're getting into that cadence. In fact, uh, we all commented, it was great to have everybody back at the Kennedy Space Center for a flight readiness review. One of the great things about this test flight is there are some differences. It's not exactly the way we did shuttle. It's not exactly the way we do uh, cargo or launch services program missions when we do the readiness reviews. So we're setting up our procedures and processes to prepare us. This is a great learning event all the way through as we work through all the issues that we have to clear everything for readiness for this flight and prepare the next step for actually putting crew on board. We're figuring out how we're going to do that for this program. And uh, we've taken some of how we did shuttle. We've taken some from other areas, the way we do things, and we're setting up those procedures now. So I, I think, you know, <clears throat> we, we know how to do this. We know how to work through the issues. We know how to hold the reviews. We know how to determine what needs to get done safely in order to make it successful. And what we learn from this, we'll go back into the next set of reviews, we'll make some modifications, and we'll do it even better after having had this test flight. So this isn't just a test flight of the vehicle. It's a test flight of the entire leadership management team, many of those folks who weren't here for shuttle. So we kind of got to set it up again and teach those folks how to do this as we work through it. So uh, this has just been a, a great experience so far getting to this point. Thank you very much. Hi, Takuya Katsumura from Nippon Television, Japanese broadcaster. This question is for Doug. Um, so eight years ago, you were on the last shuttle mission, and you'll be on the first uh, Crew Dragon mission. What's your sentiment like in being able to connect the two important flights and two important eras in the U.S. Um, space exploration history? Uh, you know, it, it's it's not the easiest question to answer. I, I mean, it it was the, the only thing you can say is it's just great to have grown up in this country and, and had that opportunity and, and been able to, to participate in the last flight of the space shuttle, which in and of itself was just incredible to be part of that whole experience, that whole year uh, process of how we did what we did and then eventually flew the mission. Uh, and since then, it's kind of felt like uh, trying to get us back to a point where the United States could fly humans in space again. And I, I kind of felt like that was something that was important to me to, to do before I did something else uh, with my life. And, and once again, I think it's just a case of, you know, I was in the right spot at the right time and had the right qualifications to be selected to be in this flight. And um, it, it's a tremendous, tremendous honor. And, and 
I, I take it very seriously every day. Uh, I try not to think about it too much because, you know, the focus that Bob and I and, and Mike and Victor have right now is just demo one, then in-flight abort, and then demo two, and then, as Bob said earlier, getting these guys up there for six months for uh, an expedition. And so that's what we've been doing. And, and frankly, I've been part of the commercial crew program in some way, shape, or form basically since I landed uh, on Atlantis almost eight years ago. So uh, it'll be really neat to finally get Dragon in space uh, and, and get to the space station again. But it's, it's, it's a great thing for NASA. It's a great thing for SpaceX. And it's a great thing for the United States. Hi guys, Phil Keating, Fox News Channel. Um, Victor and Mike, good news. You finally get to chime in. But the question <laughs> is time. the question is for all four of you. You know, the only thing on board is uh, the mannequin Ripley, but it's loaded with sensors, which are really about your own safety in the future. Uh, how impressed and confident are you with SpaceX and its relationship with NASA here that you, would you actually be willing to be on board for this maiden voyage? Why and why not? Calling me, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Calling me out. Uh, so that's a tough question as well, right? Because as we prepared for the uh, the DM1 mission, of course, it was done knowing that there weren't crew on board, and and so like everything uh, that's uh, that's been going on over the past eight nine years with commercial crew, it's been a partnership between SpaceX and it's been a partnership with NASA and the safety teams and the engineering teams and all of them evaluating this this particular vehicle and making sure it's ready for this particular milestone. And this particular milestone uh, doesn't include crew and and I think there's important reasons why uh, we don't put, if we can, if we don't have to put crew on, on something of a first flight like this uh, for safety reasons and, and I think that's smart. Um, so in, in terms of uh, if we were going to be on that, I think it, it uh, there it would probably be a little bit different uh, process getting to this point. Maybe you'd uh, reevaluate some of the risks a little bit differently. And so I think if, uh, if we were a part of the plan, uh, I think uh, we would be ready for that and we'd be ready to go. Anyone else? So first, I apologize for the glare coming off my head. It's a little warm out here. but uh, So I'm going to answer your question directly first and say no. Um, because we've, we've learned something. You've got a group of folks up here, all the training and experience that's up here uh, as, as developmental flight testers. Um, and even though I'm the rookie in the group, I'm still a test pilot, uh, uh, military test pilot as well. And we, we understand the importance of that build-up approach. And so uh, if we were to put a crew on that, I can tell you this, we wouldn't be having this press conference right now. It, we may fly a first flight. You know, you're probably referring back to the shuttle and uh, in that era. And if we were to try to do it uh, with that approach, it would take us a lot longer. So uh, I'm very happy that we're doing it this way and that we're going to get Bob and Doug up there uh, to finish shaking out and uh, uh, the in-flight abort and make sure that we're ready to go when we do a long-duration mission. So, no. So, Bob and Doug, did you, do you anticipate any nervousness the next, you know, this summer, ideally? <laughs> I, well, I, I guess that uh, part of the reason that we're in the job that we're in is that we tend to get nervous kind of after the fact <laughs> rather than in the moment. Uh, they do their best from a training perspective to try to, beat that all out of you by giving you a lot of experiences before you jump into the actual spaceship and, and ride it into space. And I, I remember on my first shuttle launch, uh, we did have a, an anomaly right off the pad and uh, uh, we were flying through a cloud deck and there was a lot of orange light coming through the, uh, through the windows. And so when those two things happen, an anomaly and the orange light coming through, you start to think about whether or not those are confirming cues of badness, you know, and uh, I remember going through that moment and really having just a, a fraction of a second where, you know, you could be scared, but really thinking internally that, well, I hope everything was done that could be done because we're, we're still heading in the direction that we're headed. And so there was, there was really nothing I could do at that point. Being nervous wasn't going to help. Definitely 10 days later when our whole Ascent flight deck space shuttle crew played back the video of that moment, that's when we all went through the nervousness of the, the actual situation and we realized hey, that was a little bit strange. That wasn't what we were expecting. The separation from the external tank didn't go the way that we expected it to, but we lived through it real time and, and it just was something that we processed and executed and then got scared uh, uh, several days later when we actually played back the tape. Just to answer the question that you initially asked, I think that uh, the process that uh, Colonel Cabana outlined earlier included our SpaceX partners. And so I think they would acknowledge that they have more work going forward uh, in preparation for the Demo 2 flight that we'll be on. I'm sure there'll be work that 
is a part of that in-flight abort mission as well that they want to accomplish before they fly that one. And so I think as a team, we would all agree that we probably aren't ready for the uh, DEMO-2 mission. We expect to get a lot of data from this one that will provide us with a, a better understanding of what we face when we jump into that actual test flight in preparation for the uh, expedition crews that come after us. But I think as a team, including SpaceX, we would say that, hey, this is not DEMO-2, this is, this is DEMO-1, and that's what we assess. Mike Wallace, space.com. Um, going back to, to a couple questions ago, I mean, yeah, yeah this is going to be the, yeah, it's going to be a flight off of off of Pad 39A, and I mean, we've seen the shuttle go off of that many times. I mean, I, yeah, yeah, I just wonder if this upcoming milestone kind of occasions any introspection about what the shuttle meant and kind of what it meant to this country and what it was able to achieve. So, I mean, yeah, yeah, some of you guys have yeah, have actually flown on the shuttle, so so I'm just wondering if if you have any feelings about that, if it if, if it kind of brings anything up about about what the legacy is and so on. Well, first off, this pad has an awesome legacy. Like I said earlier, you know, I mean, all the flights that went to the moon launched off this pad. But this isn't the first launch off this pad since the shuttle launched. You know, SpaceX has launched, uh, I think, 13 times off this pad. They launched the Falcon Heavy. They launched 12 Falcon 9s. They had uh, cargo to the International Space Station. To me, it's just, it's an excellent use of a national resource to be able to repurpose it so it just doesn't sit idle out there, rusting away in the salt air. I mean, how much better could that be? And, you know, from a shuttle point of view, hey, the shuttle was an absolutely amazing vehicle. And we talk about reusable vehicles. I mean, the shuttle was reusable for 30 years. We reused the orbiter, the engines, the solid rocket motors. The only thing we didn't reuse was the external tank. So, you know, what, you know, the International Space Station, we couldn't have built it without the shuttle. I, I think it was just a tremendous program. But that's the past, and what we got to focus on is the future. We got to focus on commercializing low Earth orbit. The shuttle was too expensive for a commercial company to run and operate and make a profit. That was a national asset, a national program, a government program. With these commercial rockets, we now have the ability to commercialize low Earth orbit and allow NASA to do that really critical job of exploring beyond our home planet, to do the expensive work to lay the groundwork in cooperation with uh, our commercial partners. So, you know, what does it mean to me? It means we're making use of an awesome asset that this nation has here at the Kennedy Space Center, and I'm just happy to see rockets flying off it. Thank you. Hi, everyone. This is Trevelli Herrera with the Orlando Sentinel. I'm hoping uh, you can take us a little bit behind the scenes of uh, what you all are thinking as you're getting closer to this. This is the first, you know, the first uh, for SpaceX. Um, what is going on in your heads with your families as you're talking about it, the camaraderie maybe you have with each other, um, you know, as people, not just as astronauts participating in this. What are you talking to your families about? What are you talking to each other about now as this is becoming really real? Whoever wants to take it. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't know if you know this, but both Bob and I are married to astronauts, so in a lot of cases, it makes the discussions at home a little easier because they both understand, I think, what we're kind of working towards and, and what you would deal with on launch day. And, and you know, I've, I've told Victor this a couple times, you know, the hardest, the hardest job is not your job, it's the spouse watching you launch into space. So an appreciation for that. So whatever you can do to include your family in any event. And, and this is a little bit unique because especially for Bob and I, we've been, we've been traveling across the country for both SpaceX and Boeing for the last three and a half years uh, working on this program. So just to include them in our trips to California, our trips to Huntsville, or our trips to wherever we went, Denver, and here. And, 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 and it could be the most innocuous things that you had happen or that you saw for the first time. And, and the little excitement the first time you do an ascent in a simulator, in a SpaceX simulator or a Boeing simulator the first time. Uh, it may not seem like that big a deal, but it's a pretty big deal when, you know, when we first started, this was just, this program was just PowerPoint charts. And now we have, we got a vehicle out on the pad. So, and, and and they understand that. And I think it, as much as you can include your families in this from start to finish, they become just as invested as you do. And they, and they know that it's filled with ups and downs and, and they're along to enjoy it with you. you uh, anything else? Are you gonna do anything special as uh, the crew flights get closer in terms of preparing uh, with each other and with your families? Uh, we, we had a pretty nice little Christmas party uh, with our families and the four of us. 
and there was no cameras, so I'm not going to tell you what happened, but it was fun. <laughs> Uh, and then, I don't know, we're, and that, that's, we, we kind of talked about that the other day. You know, there's, we have a chance to develop a tradition for all the crews that fly on, on Dragon. And, and so that, it's a little bit of a, a hefty task to kind of come up with some of this stuff, but maybe that'll just happen naturally. But I think, you know, that, that's kind of the neat stuff that, we, that we're looking forward to continue to do and, and kind of pass on down the line to some of the newer astronauts that are going to fly these vehicles. I would just uh, maybe describe uh, every one of these events that you describe as a special one that we're getting back into as we try again to uh, get astronauts flying again off the Florida coast is uh, one that we look at and try to understand what opportunities there are to learn from it. And so at a, a recent uh, cargo mission, uh, my wife and I uh, looked at the schedule and looked at what was in front of us uh, for this mission where I would be in the flight control room and trying to follow along with that team to consider what we could do as a family to prepare for for my eventual flight into space. And uh, the last time I flew into space, I didn't have a son. I didn't have any children. And, and now I have a, a, a four-year-old and he had not been to a rocket launch before. And I didn't want his first one to be his father launching into space. And so we came down here and we're on the top of the, uh, the building just across the way and watched that mission together as a family in preparation for my eventual flight on a Falcon. Luckily, it was a, a Falcon 9 uh, mission that was headed to space station. So there were a lot of similarities to the mission that I'll fly on. And so each one of these opportunities, we look at very carefully, at least I do with my spouse as a family to see, hey, what can we take away from it technically, which is what I'm gonna do here for the demo mission number one. What could we take away from it from a family? You know, we had to have the discussion, should I wake my son up in the middle of the night tonight to try to get him to watch this rocket launch? He's kind of grumpy when you wake him up. And so it's a trade-off case, right? So I gotta make that decision. And so uh, having seen this mission, we get to maybe not uh, wake him up in the middle of the night this time around, so. We have time for one more question. Um, hi, Irene Klotz with Aviation Week. Um, maybe for Doug, if you could put your old crew cadre hat on for a second. And I was wondering what you could um, have any thoughts or concerns about the prospect of the Boeing crew flight test turning into an extended station stay. And for uh, Mr. Bridenstine, when you expect to make that call, since you're now hopefully within 10 months of that flight. Um, well, they're, they're, I, I know all three of those folks very well. Obviously, we all do. We, we see them almost every week at, at Johnson. Um, they're training for a long duration mission as we speak. I think they were in the NBL the other day and they've got a trip to Russia, a training trip to Russia soon. And you know that uh, it, you, can, you can think a lot about whether you know a, a full long duration mission is what will happen or it'll be kind of maybe a few months it just kind of depends but they'll be ready for it i think um going into this they, even before we were selected for those missions they knew that the boeing flight might be a longer flight than potentially the spacex flight so i think they're they're fine i, I you know mike fink was our boss up until just a few weeks ago and he's been to space station gosh, three times, I think. So he's more than qualified to handle any eventuality in that flight. And, uh, you know, with Fergie, he's been there several times. And, and Duke, this will be her first flight, but she's, she's as capable as anybody we have in the office. They'll be, they'll be great. I, I would just say that um, as it gets closer, we're going to be able to assess what the needs are and uh, we'll make determinations based on what those needs are. Um, what Victor talked about earlier, as, as far as a step-by-step -step approach, uh, there's no reason to prejudge what is necessary. Um, and I don't, I don't have a timeline for you at this time. I know that's probably not the answer you wanted to, to receive, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, we're gonna have specific requirements in order to do what we need to do on the International Space Station. Um, and at the same time, we have requirements. I have a requirement to make sure that the guys behind me are safe. Um, and so we're going to do we're going to do that first. I want to be clear about this point, though, um, and I think Victor made this point very clear earlier. We are not in a space race. Like we, we have no requirement to go early. That race is over. <laughs> we went to the moon and we won. It's done. <laughs> now we're in a position where we can take our time and make sure we get it right. That's the goal here. Make sure we get it right, um, and that's what we intend to do. So thanks. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, I want to thank you all for coming out today. Uh, this is an absolutely exciting time for NASA, for the Kennedy Space Center, for human spaceflight, for our nation. And uh, I, this is an awesome group back here. These guys are, are awful humble, but uh, they've worked really hard to be prepared for uh, what's coming up now. And uh, I, I got to admit, I really envy you. I'd, I told them walking out, I'd trade places with them, and they said, not on your life. You know, that's it. So. I hope you all enjoy the launch tonight. It's going to be fantastic. Uh, last I checked, everything's on track. The weather's still looking good. So uh, go Dragon, uh, go Falcon. Thank you.